Jonah chapter 1, beginning in verse 4. Then the Lord sent a great wind on the sea, and such a violent storm arose that the ship threatened to break up. All the sailors were afraid, and each cried out to his own God. And they threw the cargo into the sea to lighten the ship. But Jonah had gone below deck, where he lay down and fell into a deep sleep. The captain went to him and said, How can you sleep? Get up and call on your God. Maybe he will take notice of us so that we will not perish. So we're going to be talking today about crisis. And it's going to be an interesting path. We're going to look first at the crisis faced by the sailors and how they experienced it. And then we're going to go back through the story. It'll be quicker the second time through. And we're going to consider the differences between Jonah and the sailors in terms of their response to the crisis that they were facing. Now, for those of you who were here last week, we're aware that Jonah is in rebellion against God. God had told him to go to Nineveh, but instead of going to Nineveh, Jonah had turned and gone in the opposite direction to Tarshish. So Jonah is a bad example in that way, though last week we did talk about the positive aspects of God giving Jonah grace to head in the wrong direction before God would turn him back. But today we're going to look at Jonah as a bit of a positive example. When people who have been raised in the faith rebel, they often still carry with them the character and the instruction and the foundation that's been laid by their upbringing in the faith. And that's true with Jonah. His upbringing as a Hebrew person under the law of Moses in relationship with God allowed him to face the crisis that occurred on the ocean or the Mediterranean Sea differently than the other sailors. We're going to spend a lot of time thinking about that. And one of the things that Jonah knew that the sailors did not know is that the God he served was not safe. The story of Jonah is going to help us to understand that the God you and I serve is not safe. That should go without saying. There's nobody above God. He created everything that is. He breathed life into all things and sustains all things by his power. There's no one who can judge him. He's accountable to nothing and to nobody. And he's unlimited, it seems, in his capacity to do things. That's pretty terrifying. We have a saying on earth. Absolute power corrupts absolutely. There would be nothing to stop the corruption of God if that is what he was. But the confession that he is good is our hope. And he's demonstrated that goodness to us in countless ways. But he is not safe. So how do we navigate our way in a world in which God will often have us go through things that we in our own strength would choose to avoid? Essentially, we're asking, what kind of relationship is God offering to you and me? What do I get out of this? What does he get out of this? I mean, what am I allowed to do? Last week, we talked about the fact that God makes room for Jonah's doubt. That God allows Jonah even a season of rebellion in order to better understand why God commands what he does. God uses sometimes the events of our lives to teach us things we couldn't otherwise learn. And we talked about that. Today, we're going to talk about what it means to follow a God who will allow us to walk through seasons of crisis? And how can our knowledge of God help us? And what you'll notice in these sailors, and you probably have already seen it, is that when crisis hits, they begin to become super religious. That is basically the the source of all religion on earth. Humans are going along just fine, and then something happens that we can't deal with. And suddenly we start looking for a way to control the uncontrollable, and that's how religions get started. There are two impulses in religion. One of them is to gain greater control over the forces in the world that control my destiny so that I can better control my destiny. That's one impulse of all world religions. The other impulse is to better acclimate myself to the uncontrollable aspects. But the ancient Hebrew faith of Israel and the Christian faith of the church, they stand apart from those religious instincts if we're honest about what the scriptures teach us. That's what we're going to talk about today as we journey through with Jonah in his rebellious trip to Tarshish. We'll explore some distinctions between 
the religiousness of the sailors and the religiousness of Jonah as we walk through the three steps of this story, the predicament, the panic, and the pandering. Let's start with the predicament. Look at verse 4 of Jonah chapter 1. Then the Lord sent a great wind on the sea, and such a violent storm arose that the ship threatened to break up, or as the Hebrew says, the ship thought it was going to be torn apart. Now, these are, these are seasoned sailors, we're imagining. They're taking a very, very long boat ship to Tarshish, a boat trip to, to Tarshish, so they know the sea, and the Mediterranean Sea can be a dangerous one. So we imagine if they thought the ship was going down, it likely was going down. And so those moments of crisis that threaten to transform all of our lives fundamentally, maybe it's life or death, Maybe it's a diagnosis, maybe it's a storm or a hurricane or a tornado or whatever in the world might happen. When we face those things, what often happens is that we are forced to face all of life and all of death at the same time. A crisis has a way of interrupting our lives to such a degree that suddenly we no longer know where in the world we are or where in the world we were going. That's what a crisis does, and that's what it initiates in these sailors. The same human response it does in you and in me. And that's our second point. It initiates a panic. Look at verse 5. All the sailors were afraid, and the Hebrew here I think is better to say terrified. All the sailors were terrified, and each cried out to his own God, and they threw the cargo into the sea to lighten the ship. So this religious instinct kind of rises up. So there are a lot of prayers that fly out of foxholes and out of doctor's offices and out of car accidents, but they're not prayers of faith. They're prayers of desperation. They're prayers of let's try everything. I'm going to cross my fingers and throw salt over my shoulder and knock on wood and consult my horoscope and pray to God, any God I can find, and ask everybody who knows anything about God to pray for me too. Let's just do it all. Let's just spread our diverse, diversify our investments. If if 90% sink, maybe one will get me there. This is the panic, and this is what happens to the sailors. They hit a crisis, and they don't know what to do. So they do the rational thing first, throw everything overboard. That'll lighten the ship. Maybe it'll keep it afloat. And then, anybody know any gods? Let's pray to them all. Maybe one of them can stop this storm. That's the religious instinct of the sailors. And then finally, the pandering began. All the sailors were afraid, and each cried out to his own God, and they threw the cargo into the sea to lighten the ship. But Jonah had gone below deck, where he lay down and fell into a deep sleep. And this is where we hear this. The captain went to him and said, How can you sleep? Get up and call on your God. Maybe he'll take notice of us, so we will not perish. A crisis initiates a panic response And then the manipulation begins. And that's what pandering is. Pandering is trying to get somebody to do what you want by doing nice things for them or sucking up to them or giving them compliments or giving them money or whatever it takes, candy. This is what's happening with the sailors, with the gods. They're praying and they can't get any response. So now they go to the one person sleeping. They figure he's sleeping. He must know more than we do. Maybe it's his God he can pray to. Maybe he can get that God to do it. This is what we do when you've never prayed, but you go through a crisis and you ask someone to pray for you. That's what they're doing for Jonah. You don't feel you have the access to God, but maybe that person has the access to God. So maybe if they pray, it'll get done. In many ways, you and I are treating God like a vending machine and we're just trying to figure out what currency we need to use to get out of it what we want. This is what's happening on the ship. These folks were not raised with knowledge of the true God of all creation. They know nothing about him. So a crisis occurs... They begin to panic and just throw spaghetti at the wall and see what sticks. They go through every religious ritual that they are aware of in their culture. Anything they ever heard anybody did that worked. And they just go through it on the ship. And then they start trying to appease these deities. Later they're going to make sacrifices to the different deities and see if they can get things to stop. So that is the normal human response to crisis. What I want you to notice, and we're going to go back through the story quickly to see this, is how different Jonah's response is. So Jonah does not avoid the crisis. So this story doesn't begin by saying, God's prophets will avoid hard times. In fact, 
This passage doesn't even say, don't worry when you sin as a believer, because when you sin as a believer, you're already forgiven, so it's no big deal, life will still go fine. It doesn't say that either, right? Jonah's rebelled against God, and he sails into a crisis. Now, not all crises are because of disobedience, but in Jonah's case, it was. And so Jonah does not avoid the crisis simply because he's a prophet. The prophet is in the same boat with all these sailors facing the same peril. So that's important for us to know. But Jonah responds very differently to his peril. Have you noticed? Everybody else is freaking out. They're throwing stuff overboard. They're praying to gods. They're going to start making sacrifices. They're going to do whatever it takes. And Jonah is asleep. Now some of you who know the stories of the gospel will see the reflection of this behavior in the life of Jesus. You remember a similar story, right? When Jesus and the disciples were on a boat and they're going across to the other side and a windstorm comes up and the disciples lose their minds the same way the sailors did and Jesus is asleep and the disciples say essentially the same thing to Jesus that these sailors said to Jonah. How can you sleep through this? But Jonah's asleep even though he's in rebellion because he knows something about God the sailors do not. He knows that God is good, that he is just, and that his decisions somehow make sense. Those three things are a guide for Jonah. So Jonah expects the storm. He is not under the delusion that he's not going to face one. Jonah knows God asked him to do something. He knows he hasn't done it, and he knows a storm is coming. So for Jonah, this storm doesn't just pop out out of nowhere. It's part of a rational godly decision and so jonah also knows something else he also knows that you can't manipulate the god of all creation that you can't simply make him think you're repentant by protesting because he can see directly through us because he can see to our inner heart's motivations there's no way we could pull the wool over his eyes jonah had no intention of repenting he believed that god was asking him to do something that wasn't right and he knew he couldn't persuade god to change his mind so jonah expected the storm and he made, spent no wasted no time trying to manipulate god's response is that amazing for a man in rebellion but you see he had been shaped by the law of Moses. It's what he knew about God that gave him peace in the midst of his storms. When you and I face a storm and we panic, one of the things that reveals about us is we do not really either know or believe what we need to know or believe about God to make it through the worst of times. Jonah knew something and this is the key folks we cannot survive the worst of times with our feelings or with our instincts too many christians are not attending to their knowledge of god to survive a crisis is it amazing that jonah survived his storm because he knew he deserved it Jonah didn't lose his mind because he knew it was just to send that storm. How many of us could grow to that extent? This is the justice he was asking for. He disobeyed because he thought God was too gracious. And Jonah receives it. The only thing in the entire book of Jonah that Jonah agrees with is the storm. The only thing in the entire book of Jonah that Jonah agrees with is the storm. He is at peace only once in this story, and it is when he's in the storm. That makes sense to him. We must attend to theology. You and I must know what we believe about God and why. Knowledge of God will tether you in the worst of storms. But you must attend to your knowledge of God. And the only way to do that, folks, is to read regularly His Word, to discuss it with other Christians, to seek counsel when we don't get it, 
and to work through how our understanding drives everything we do. You were all the lowest academic achievers among you to the highest. You are all gifted with the largest, most complicated intellect in all of creation that we know of. And God has given that to you so that you can survive storms no other creature can. And that's what it means to say that we are saved by faith, by trust in a God who knows more than us, but the knowledge of whom can tether us through the worst of things. We need to study. We need to read. We need to be attentive to worship. We need to think about what we sing. Think about what we pray. All of these things will help you. But here's the truth. You're going to face some storms no matter how faithful you are. Some of you will put it off a long time. It'll be near the end of life. Others of you will hit storms all throughout your life. I don't know the logic of it, but I can tell you this. The God who gave you life has not forsaken you because you're entering a storm. And the deeper your knowledge of him, the better you will weather it. And you know how deep your relationship goes by how much you look like Jonah or how much you look like the sailors in the midst of a crisis. And that's not a judgment. Crisis can be used as a moment of self-revelation. It can show us who we really are. And in that moment, we can attend to the things that we have been forgetting. But this is our covenant as pastor and people. We will always be attentive to the word because our desire is that when the storms hit, we would have the trust that we need to see it through. And when the worst of storms hit and the ship does go down and you do not rise above the water, the promise of God to you in Jesus is that he will raise you from the dead. So even when the waters seem to win, even when the crisis seems to be in control. God has the last word. And we don't need to beg him to love us. We don't need to cajole him to care about us. We don't need to pander or manipulate him to get his eye on us. He tells us that he knows every sparrow that falls. And you are worth more than many sparrows. His eye is always on you. You don't need to beg for that. We don't pray to control God. We pray to interact with him. We pray because we know he hears. And we pray because we know he will answer in his will. And we submit to whatever that will is. And we trust that whatever happens, whatever the outcome of this storm, we can trust the God who leads us. Life will not always be easy for you. But if you start following Jesus, if you start reading your Bible, you will find that whatever storm you face as you age, you will be able to have peace. 